Welcome to the third part of our three-part series on subcontractor scopes of work. My name is Jason Smith and I'll be presenting this course. This three-part series is focused on how to prevent mistakes in writing subcontract scope attachments. As we've all come to learn during our careers, there's nothing that makes the president, vice president, and executives more upset than seeing money go out the door for mistakes that could have and should have been prevented. Easily preventable mistakes in writing subcontractor scope attachments is the focus of this course. There are two things I'd like to point out very quickly before we move on. My courses are always presented as a series of examples. I've always found examples to be much more interesting and informative than long, drawn-out theoretical discussions. And secondly, these discussions revolve around change order issues. Now, change order issues are eclectic. They're not systematic. I mention this because our discussion is going to be organized by trade, but during each trade discussion, I'm going to provide a myriad of diverse issues associated with each respective sub. The course is clear and organized, of course, but we'll be jumping from one issue to the next very quickly. The goal here is to cover as much information as we possibly can in this short amount of time. Let's quickly run through the goals of this course. You will gain a solid, applied knowledge of the intricacies of each subcontractor's scope of work, particularly how to avoid scope gaps and double coverages. You will also learn the intricacies of writing comprehensive bid instructions for each of the individual building trades. Specific to Part 3 of this course, you will also attain a good working knowledge of the interior architectural and mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection trades. The primary focus is how the work of a project is delineated among the myriad of subcontractors. You will also become more knowledgeable in your role as a leader of the subcontractors. In this third session of the three-part series, we'll discuss interior architectural work, such as stud framing, floor, wall, and ceiling finishes, casework, coiling doors, and a few others. We will also address the always complicated mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire sprinkler trades. All right, let's move into the examples. Our first examples focus on some of the often overlooked scope issues associated with the stud framing. Low wall posts are typically furnished and installed by the miscellaneous metal subcontractor. These are a very common scope gap. Low wall posts are used for freestanding walls that have no top support. Low height walls, such as a 42 inch guardrail, commonly need low wall posts. Stud walls require anchorage at the bottom and the top, particularly the top corner. Stud walls cannot freestand by themselves. Both miscellaneous metals and interior stud framing are, for all intents and purposes, design-build trades. Design-build work is not typically addressed by the design team, so low wall posts may not be shown on the drawing. And this is why they're commonly missed during the bidding phase. Architects commonly claim that these are design-build issues, so the GC just needs to coordinate them. On the other hand, general contractors commonly hold that this is a design issue, and these low wall posts need to be shown on the drawings. The reality of the world we live in is that when these become change order issues, general contractors often lose this contentious debate. This course won't discuss the debate as to whether or not these need to be in the drawings. As many of you have already learned in your careers, that could be a course in and of itself. What we will discuss in this course is the simple fact that low wall posts are not always shown in the drawings, and the reality is that we need to deal with it. The best way to win a debate is to prevent the debate from having to occur in the first place. So when you see a freestanding wall in the drawings that you know is going to need steel posts, include those in your bid. Many of you out there are asking this next question. What about for hard bid work? That puts us in a bad position. For hard bid jobs, if you include something like this that you know your competitors aren't going to be smart enough to include, your bid will be higher and you could lose the job as a result. This is obviously a huge concern. Do you risk losing the job now because your bid's too high? Or do you risk losing money on this item later if you lose the change order debate? That's not a good position to be in. That's a lose-lose position. But I've got a solution for you. Here's the best way i found to handle issues like this. When you see a low wall that you know is going to need a steel post, but that steel post is not shown on the drawings, send a pre-bid RFI to the architect that asks if low wall posts are going to be necessary for those freestanding walls. Now you know they're necessary, so it's really, at face value, what I call a stupid RFI. On a hard bid job, when you send an RFI like this in, 
the architect is going to respond to it and send the response to every other bidder. So, every other bidder is going to be told via that RFI before bidding that low wall posts need to be included. That's a great way to make sure that your competitors pick these things up. And that levels the playing field and makes sure everyone is including the same thing. When you let the architect know why you're asking that question, the architect is really going to appreciate it because architects don't like change orders either. Interestingly, framing estimators will search out standard backing throughout the project drawings. Examples of common project components requiring backing include casework, stair handrails, MEP control cabinets, toilet partitions, and lockers. This is really unique as most subcontractors will exclude anything that isn't specifically shown on the drawings. These project components so commonly require backing that framing estimators just automatically know to pick them up. And it has become an industry standard for framing subs to provide backing for these types of items. However, framing estimators will not search out uncommon backing throughout the project drawings. This is the non-intuitive backing, backing that does not occur commonly from project to project, such as handrails and toilet partitions. Examples of non-standard backing might include interior expansion joint covers, key cabinets, wall-mounted speakers, or large signage. Where the line is drawn between common and uncommon backing is a very hazy line. So my recommendation to general contractors when it comes to backing is the estimator who is reviewing the project for bid flag everything that's going to require backing and put it on the scope sheet for your framing bidders. This is the best way to make sure that they pick them up. Now, it's okay to list common backing on the scope sheet. If you tell the framing bidders that they need to provide backing for casework, sure, they'll provide it. They'd provide it whether you write that or not. What you don't want to do is overlook uncommon backing. If you neglect to mention that the interior expansion joints require backing, your framing subcontractor might come to you with a change order request through the course of the project. So keep an eye out for backing as you review the drawings, and any time you come across some backing, jot it down on a backing log, and include that backing log in the framer's scope of work. Next, we'll discuss coordination issues between the framing and other trades. There are many trades that intersect the framing work. Anything that's recessed in, mounted on, or passes through a stud wall needs to be coordinated with the framing subcontractor. The framing subcontractor provides the interior structure for all other trades. Be sure the framing bidders are notified when and where out-of-sequence work will occur, such as at restrooms and data rooms. Rooms that have a great deal of work required by other trades are, by nature, on the critical path of the schedule. Restrooms, data rooms, and sometimes mechanical rooms fall into this category. So naturally, we need to start those rooms as early as possible in order to avoid a project delay. And this means that the framing subcontractor is going to need to jump around the site to frame, rock, and tape these isolated rooms. However, framing subcontractors want to start in one spot and continually frame out from that point. Having them jump around the site to frame, rock, and tape these individual rooms out of sequence has an inefficiency cost associated with it. There are two suggested ways of showing this out of sequence work in the bid documents. Preferably, we'll show it on the project schedule. But if the project bid schedule has not been developed with enough detail to show this out-of-sequence work, we can also do it in the bid instructions. The framing bidder needs to know all of the room numbers that need to be constructed out-of-sequence. Otherwise, the framing subcontractor is unlikely to do this out-of-sequence work without receiving a change order for it. Access doors and gypsum board walls and ceilings are usually furnished by the subcontractor whose work they are for then they are installed by the framing subcontractor in conjunction with the framing and gypsum board work. The MEP subcontractors are accustomed to furnishing access doors as a standard practice. And like backing, framing estimators are accustomed to searching out where MEP access doors are located and including installation of that quantity of access doors in their base bid. We rarely run into a scope problem when it comes to MEP access doors. It's the non-MEP access doors that become a problem. Not only will the framing estimators not search out or include installation of Division 1 through 14 access doors, the Division 1 through 14 subcontractors will not include furnishing access doors either. Those trades are not accustomed to furnishing access doors. 
Those access doors need to be included in the bid scopes. Both furnishing and installing of Division 1 through 14 access doors needs to be specifically allocated in your bid instructions. For example, let's consider a coiling door motor that is above a gypsum board ceiling. We'll need an access door to access that coiling door motor, but the coiling door subcontractor will not include furnishing it unless specifically directed to, and the framing subcontractor won't include installation unless they're specifically directed. This becomes especially important in fire rated walls and ceilings because fire rated access doors can be hundreds of dollars apiece. Cement board joints behind ceramic tile normally require mesh tape. However, this requirement, which is required to provide a suitable substrate for the ceramic tile installation, is not always found in the design documents. This is a common requirement for ceramic tile installations. And once again, this is an example of where the design team may hold that it's a means and methods issue for the general contractor to deal with, and conversely, the general contractor will argue that this should be reflected in the design documents. But in the end, one way or another, we need it. Regardless of the differing opinions, remembering to include this work in the bid instructions avoids the argument. The only way to truly win an argument is to prevent the argument from having to occur in the first place. This is another good example of what you might want to send a pre-bid RFI in for on a hard bid project. Next, we'll discuss doors, frames, and hardware. Anyone who's ever taken bids for doors, frames, and hardware will attest that this scope of work is much more convoluted than it appears at face value. Especially on hard bid public works projects, you can expect to receive a wide variety of bid combinations, and many of the scopes of work reflected by the bids will not match each other. The doors, frames, and hardware scope of work is a very difficult puzzle to put together on bid day. You may get bids for hollow metal doors and frames. You may get individual bids for hollow metal doors and individual bids for hollow metal frames. And you might get some bids for wood doors that include pre-finished doors that are finished at the factory. And you might get other bids for wood doors that require field finishing. And that field finishing would need to be provided by the painter. You're likely to receive separate bids for aluminum doors and frames. You might receive separate bids for door hardware. You might receive a bid for hollow metal doors and frames that includes hardware, but wood doors that does not include door hardware. And you will receive bids with any combination of these items. So as you can see from this very brief example, the doors, frames, and hardware scope truly is a convoluted puzzle that needs to be put together on bid day. The doors, frames, and hardware may sound simple. It may sound like something you want to have your intern take bids for, but this is absolutely not a job for an intern. To further complicate things, some of the bids you receive will be furnish only, other bids will be furnished and installed, and yet other bidders might bid installation only. What you see here is a spreadsheet that I developed to illustrate which of the various bidders may include the various items of work associated with the doors, frames, and hardware scope. And I've listed these parties in the possible allocations column you see in the middle. As you can see, just at first glance, this is a very confusing column. Well, I'm obviously not going to leave you in a bed of confusion. So I've also added the column on the right, Suggested Allocations. This column lists the party that I recommend you allocate each item of work to. Although the Suggested Allocation column may seem to simplify things, I do need to make it clear that on a hard bid public works project, in order to get the lowest, most competitive bid, you really won't have a choice but to deal with all of those various pieces of the puzzle you'll really only be able to use these suggested allocations on a private project where you have more control over who's bidding and how the bids will be received. Compiling the bids for hollow metal doors and frames might involve bids from a framing manufacturer, the door subcontractor, a framing subcontractor, and or a masonry subcontractor. And this is just for hollow metal doors and frames. And as you see in the descriptions of items 2, 3, and 4, Bids may not only be segregated upon the type of door and frame, but actually where it's installed. You may have hollow metal frames and stud walls installed by a framing sub, while hollow metal frames at a CMU wall are installed by a masonry sub. As you see in the suggested allocation column, I prefer to have all of these items completed by the door subcontractor, with one exception, item 3. When you have a hollow metal frame at a CMU wall, the allocation of work will depend on the installation method. If the door frame is designed such that it needs to be installed before or in conjunction with the CMU work, 
then it's best to have the masonry subcontractor install those frames. This would be the case if the hollow metal frame actually wraps the CMU, or if the frame anchors are actually embedded in the CMU. However, if the frame is designed such that it can be installed after the CMU wall is complete, I usually find it's best to have the door subcontractor go ahead and do it. This would be a door frame that does not wrap the CMU with anchors that can be post-installed. What's called a punched and dimpled frame might be installed by the door subcontractor. The scope allocations for wood doors and frames are quite similar to hollow metal. And once again, I recommend allocating these to a single door subcontractor. I also suggest that you allocate the aluminum doors, frames, and hardware to that same single door subcontractor. Now we're moving into even more of a hodgepodge of the doors, frames, and hardware. Let me point out a few things here. Item 12, furnishing storefront hardware. This item is very non-intuitive. In the case of storefront hardware, we'll commonly have the glass subcontractor provide the pivots, which is what storefront door hinges are termed, but the door subcontractor will furnish all of the other hardware. Item 15, installation of the storefront hardware. The glass subcontractor should actually install the hardware that is provided by the door subcontractor. This is an industry standard delegation of work that has evolved from the fact that the hinges of a storefront door, aka the pivots, are different than the hollow metal or wood doors and frames. So those pivots can be provided by the glass subcontractor because they don't need to match anything else on site. However, panic hardware, lever hardware, cylinders, and other hardware on the storefront doors commonly does match the hardware provided for hollow metal, wood, and other doors and this is why the door subcontractor will actually furnish that hardware. However, when it comes to installation, we want one subcontractor responsible for the total package. This is why the glass subcontractor will install the hardware that is provided by the door subcontractor. Item 13, furnishing the cylinders for coiling doors. Because we want coiling doors to be keyed to match the rest of the building, the cylinders are actually provided by the door subcontractor but as you see in item 16, they should be installed by the coiling door subcontractor. These are very simple to install, and coiling door subcontractors don't mind doing it. The common scope bust in this regard is usually furnishing of those cylinders by the door subcontractor. Furnishing and installing padlocks, items 14 and 17 on this list, are another very common scope bust. Padlocks are a loose item and often not found in the door and hardware spec. Padlocks may only be referenced from a fencing detail. Nevertheless, they're in the drawings and they need to be included. The reason it's best to have the door subcontractor furnish the padlocks is because we want the padlocks to be keyed to match the building standard. I generally like to have the door subcontractor simply hand the padlocks off to the general contractor and the general contractor can then install them at the end of the project. What's commonly termed special doors and hardware I typically like to allocate to the door subcontractor, even if they sub the work out to a lower tier sub. I won't get into too much detail on this, but a couple products that would fall into this special door category include total doors and wand doors. Gate hardware, whether the gates be chain link or steel, is a very common scope bust. As we discussed earlier in this three-part series, Prepping of the chain link and steel gates should be completed by the chain link and miscellaneous metal subcontractors respectively. Because gate hardware typically matches the rest of the building, it's best to have the door subcontractor go ahead and furnish this hardware as well. Because chain link and steel workers don't usually have experience with door hardware, I find that it's best to have the door subcontractor go ahead and install this hardware and make sure each of those openings is functioning properly. At this point, I've hopefully done my job in emphasizing how confusing the scope of work can be. So let's move on to our next example. Okay, let's now further complicate this scope by adding electronics into the mix and discussing security doors. Electronic security door controls involve the coordination of multiple trades, including the low voltage security subcontractor, the electrician, and of course the door subcontractor. On the public or non-secure side of a security door, we'll usually have a card reader. Now the card reader will do two things. When you swipe your card, it will one, unlock the door, that's obvious. Secondly, it signals the security system that this is a legal opening of the door. Otherwise, when we open the door, the alarm will go off. 
That swipe of the card tells the security system not to sound an alarm when the door is opened. On the non-public or secure side of the security door, we might have a panic bar or we might have a lever lock set. Either way, whether it be a panic bar or a lever lock set, those devices only do one thing. That's open the door. So, on the secure side of the door, we need some means of telling the security system that this is a lawful opening of the door and not to sound the alarm. From the secure side of the door, the alarm is silenced by use of a device called a request to exit device, commonly referred to as a REX device. There are two primary types of REX devices. One, as is shown in this illustration, is a REX device that is integral to the PANIC hardware. In this case, it is most efficient for the door subcontractor to provide a panic bar that comes from the factory with a request to exit device integral to the panic bar. If we don't get a panic bar with an integral REX device, we can run into a couple of problems. First, the security subcontractor will need to know to provide that REX device. Secondly, we'll have a coordination hassle and cost associated with the door subcontractor disassembling the panic device the security subcontractor installing the REX device inside the PANIC, and then the door subcontractor reassembling the PANIC device and installing it on the door. Third, when you open the PANIC device to install the REX, you may not have any place inside the PANIC to put the REX. There may not be room for it. In that case, you'll have to get a whole new PANIC bar. Where we have REX devices in PANIC bars, it is best for the door subcontractor to provide a PANIC bar with an integral REX and for the security subcontractor to be directed not to provide REX devices for those doors. Now let's talk about a door that has a lever latch set as opposed to a panic bar. Lever hardware is just too small to fit a REX device inside of it, so an integral REX is not an option for a lever handle. For doors with lever handles, we'll typically have a wall or ceiling mounted REX device. And whereas the REX device in a panic bar has an actual electrical contact to the panic bar itself and is signaled when the bar is pushed, a ceiling mounted REX device is actually a motion sensor and that motion detection will signal the security system that this is an authorized opening of the door and not to sound the alarm. Now in this case of a lever hardware, there's no necessary coordination between the door and security subcontractors for installation of that REX device. So, in the case of lever hardware, where we have a wall or ceiling mounted REX device, we'll typically have that REX device provided by the security subcontractor. Whether the REX device is integral to a panic hardware or wall or ceiling mounted, it will be wired by the security subcontractor. The wiring is not typically a scope bust. However, furnishing and installing of the REX device is a very common scope bust. And when you add up all the security doors on a project, it could be a very big bust. The conduit raceways and back boxes for this low voltage work are typically provided by the electrical subcontractor. Then the security subcontractor will pull their own wires through those conduits. This is a union jurisdictional issue. Next let's talk about how the security system knows if a door is open or closed. It does this by way of a door contact. The door contacts are two pieces. One piece that mounts to the door frame and one piece that mounts to the door. And they overlap each other. When the door opens, those two pieces are separated, which opens the circuit, which is what signals the alarm system that the door is open, and if neither a REX or card reader has silenced the alarm, the alarm will go off when the door opens. The door sensors themselves will be furnished, wired, and installed by the security subcontractor. However, the door subcontractor needs to prep the frame for the security door sensors. Prepping this frame is just a matter of five holes. We'll have two holes in the door frame for the screws, two holes in the door for the screws, and then one more hole in the door frame for the wires to go through. Drilling a few holes doesn't seem like much work, but when you add up all the security doors, it's actually quite a bit of work. And the fact is that those holes can be drilled or punched in the shop very quickly and very easily by use of a jig, whereas in the field, we have more expensive labor and overhead drilling, which is more difficult so it's best to have the doors and frames prepped in the shop. Additionally, if this prepping of the doors and frames is not addressed in the bid documents, we'll have a scope bust. The door subcontractor will assume that the security sub is going to drill their own holes, and the security subcontractor is going to assume that the door subcontractor is prepping the doors and frames for them. 
When this happens, you're going to get field tags for all of that overhead drilling throughout the project. Cooling doors in and of themselves are pretty straightforward, but I want to use a cooling door example to continue our low voltage discussion. The low voltage controls work for coiling doors is a very commonly overlooked aspect of work. Coiling doors aren't nearly as complicated as the much smaller man doors, but the one thing to keep in mind for coiling doors is that the controls conduit and wire will be provided by the electrical subcontractor. The electrical work associated with coiling doors essentially has three main arteries, all coinciding at the coiling door motor. First, and most obvious, the electrical subcontractor will bring power to the coiling door, and they'll terminate that connection on the coiling door motor. That's the easy one, and that power will be shown on the design documents. But where it gets confusing are two control circuits that will not be on the drawings. The coiling door will have a wall-mounted controller. The coiling door subcontractor will furnish and mount the controller, but the electrician will provide all conduit and wire between the controller and the coiling door motor. And third, the most obscure circuit is the door interlock. This is the one that is most commonly overlooked. The door interlock circuit prevents the motor from opening the coiling door if the coiling door is locked. So, the electrician also needs to provide conduit and wire from the coiling door motor to the door interlock, and that door interlock device will be furnished and installed by the coiling door sub themselves. Again, these control circuits will not be on the drawings, and they are a very common hit to the general contractor's contingency. Now we'll move on to the casework trade. Casework is a pretty straightforward trade, so I just have a couple pointers for you on this one. Casework subcontractors should always provide the countertops, even stone tops. On hard bid projects in particular, you will at times end up with a separate subcontractor for the tops, but that's pretty rare. Casework subcontractors might do their own plastic laminate countertops, but they may also team with a lower tier subcontractor who specializes in countertops. Either way, it's best to have the casework subcontractor handle it contractually themselves. Stone countertops will need to be completed by a mason due to union jurisdictions, but we still want the casework subcontractor to be responsible for those stone tops. It's a common practice and we want the full casework assembly under the control of a single entity. Stone countertops are really a specialty trade in and of themselves, so the mason that you've hired to do brick or CMU work elsewhere on the project probably isn't going to have a crew skilled in countertops anyway. The workers for masonry block work and for stone countertops all come from the same union, but they're vastly different skill sets, and there'll be different guys that get dispatched from the union to do it. Sink installation is usually performed on site by the plumbing subcontractor, but it's becoming increasingly popular for the sinks to be installed in the shop by the casework sub rather than on site by the plumbing subcontractor. It's difficult to perfectly align an odd shaped sink using only a paper template, so in lieu of the plumbing subcontractor simply sending paper templates to the casework shop, the casework subcontractor will often ask the plumbing sub to simply send the sinks themselves to the shop. The casework subcontractor will then mount the sinks in the counters and send those counters to the site with the sinks pre-installed. This is especially common for stone tops. This method improves both efficiency and quality control. And because this installation of a plumbing item is done in the shop as opposed to the field, we don't typically run into any sort of union jurisdictional issues. But do keep in mind that union jurisdictions vary from area to area, so please be sure your local unions don't have any issue with this approach. All holes and cutouts within cabinetry should be completed by the casework subcontractor. This includes grommets and countertops, and it also includes cutouts for conduit raceways or plumbing piping throughout the casework. If you do have the electrical and plumbing subcontractors drilling their own holes through casework, be sure those holes are only drilled in locations approved by the casework subcontractor. We don't want the electrical or plumbing subcontractors cutting through splines or other structurally important casework components. Next we'll move on to the flooring subcontractor, who typically provides all carpet and vinyl flooring products. This subcontractor who provides the carpet and vinyl flooring products is who we refer to as the quote flooring subcontractor. But they aren't the only subcontractor who installs floors. We'll have separate subcontractors for epoxy flooring, terrazzo flooring, wood flooring, ceramic tile flooring, and other specialty floorings. But for the moment we'll focus just on the carpet and vinyl flooring work. 
Adhesively set flooring products like carpet, sheet vinyl, and VCT will delaminate from the concrete if the slab moisture content is too high. In other words, if the slab hasn't had enough time to cure and dry. What you see in this photo is called an in situ moisture test. But you'll also come across calcium chloride testing out there. Calcium chloride testing is another very reliable and common method of checking moisture content in a slab. Each subcontractor applying flooring, whether it be this flooring subcontractor, the ceramic tile sub, terrazzo sub, wood floor sub, or anyone else applying a floor product, needs to be responsible for testing the moisture content of the concrete below their respective flooring systems. This is because they are each responsible for their individual warranties for their flooring systems. Okay, well moisture testing is cheap and easy. But let's talk about what happens when the moisture content is too high. That's when we get into some serious money. This means that the concrete slab needs to be sealed, and that sealer is a very costly roll applied product. In the event of high moisture content, Responsibility for this sealer cost could be the financial responsibility of the owner or the general contractor, depending on their contractual liabilities. But it will never be a subcontractor's responsibility, because the subcontractors have no control over the design or construction of the concrete slab. Now, I'm not going to address this debate in this course, because it's a very long and contentious discussion, and many of you out there watching this course have had this problem in the past and can attest to it. What I do want to state in this course is to address the responsibility for high moisture content prior to bidding a project. Make sure the risk and financial responsibility for this sealer is clearly reflected in the prime contract. It is usually most appropriate for the owner to hold financial responsibility for this, but there are other cases where the general contractor should. Again, I won't get into the intricate details of this in this course but I will let you know that it's best to have a vice president or above provide input on this prior to bidding. And I doubt that there's a vice president out there who hasn't faced this problem before or has a good action plan for it. Now, I don't mean to cower away from this. I actually hit this issue very hard in my ethics course, in which I go into great detail into this contentious debate, the varying responsibilities, and the varying reasons for these responsibilities. Floor leveling is a very frequent scope bust. The industry standard tolerance for a concrete slab is that it needs to be flat within a quarter inch and 10 feet. However, the industry standard tolerances for flooring systems are that the flooring systems need to be within an eighth of an inch and 10 feet. This is an obvious conflict between industry standard tolerances for any type of flooring that is applied directly to the top of concrete. The way we bridge this gap is to fill the low spots of a concrete deck with a leveling compound. This leveling work is routinely required, but there's no way of establishing how much is going to be necessary until the slabs are in fact placed, which obviously isn't done prior to bidding. Architects commonly deem this to be a means and methods issue, whereas general contractors consider it to be a design issue because they believe the architect needs to accommodate construction tolerances into their design. So this is another very common and very contentious issue. And once again, I'm not going to get into the details of this debate here, because that could once again be a course in and of itself. What I do want to address here is that a vice president or above should be involved in the decision making and risk management on this issue. And this is actually another issue that I went into great depth in in my ethics book. Elevator flooring is frequently overlooked. Architects commonly want the elevator flooring to match the main lobby flooring immediately outside the elevators. But architects are not generally concerned about elevator walls or ceilings matching anything outside the elevator. So the elevator subs will typically take care of walls and ceilings, but the flooring is a common scope bust. The elevator is not typically on the finish schedule, so we may only find this elevator flooring type on the elevator details or in the elevator specification. This flooring could be by a number of subcontractors. It could be stone, it could be carpet, it could be wood, or it could be some other specialty floor. Unfortunately, none of the various flooring trades will typically review elevator details or read the elevator specification. Now, of course, you may be thinking, well, we can force this work on them. For instance, if carpet is called out in the elevator specification, we can tell the flooring subcontractor that they're responsible for all contract documents and force it on them. Well, that doesn't work very well, and to be honest with you, it's not good business. Being proactive during the bidding phase is always a heck of a lot easier. 
And please remember that the only way to truly win a change order debate is to prevent the debate from ever occurring in the first place. We don't want the flooring subcontractor to take a loss on this elevator flooring because the reality is they're probably going to try and make up for that loss on future change order requests down the road. That unfortunately happens quite a bit and it's something we need to protect ourselves from. This is actually a global lesson that I'm just using this example to illustrate. Floor sealers and waxes are typically provided by the respective flooring trades, but this is not a steadfast rule. What we're talking about here might be a sealer product applied to a tile floor or waxing a sheet vinyl floor. These products could be applied by the respective flooring subcontractors, they could all be applied by the final cleaning sub, or the general contractor might even do it. And in some instances, the owner actually does it. Who applies these products really doesn't matter. What does matter is that the work is covered, but not double covered. Floor protection should be provided by each of the individual flooring trades but it should be maintained and eventually disposed of by the general contractor. This floor protection actually amounts to quite a bit of work and is a common scope bust. This protection is commonly just brown craft paper in the walking paths of the low traffic areas, but it may be masonite over the craft paper in the high traffic areas, and adding the masonite is where the cost really starts to add up. It's best for the flooring subcontractors to provide their own protection, but since the flooring subs will subsequently be off-site through the end of the project, the general contractor should maintain and eventually remove the protection. It may sound easiest to just write furnish, maintain, and remove protection in each of the different subcontract scope attachments, but the reality is we don't want to pay these subcontractors to continually check in on the site and maintain their own protection. Maintaining it and removing it is a relatively small amount of work, so it's much more efficient for the general contractor to handle maintaining and removing the protection themselves. You'll keep your bid and the project cost a little bit lower that way. Next we'll talk about wood finishing responsibilities. Painting and staining work is usually done by the painter when it's done on site, but when the painting and staining work is completed off site, it's completed by the subcontractor providing the respective component. These various allocations of work have evolved from both efficiency and union jurisdictions over time. But unfortunately, these allocations of work are not by any means intuitive. First, the easy one. Casework is always finished by the casework subcontractor, regardless of whether it's painted or stained. Stained wood doors are traditionally finished in the factory. Wood doors can be fully prepped for hardware and installation in the shop, so it's easiest to apply the finish in the shop as well. Stained millwork is actually finished on site by the painting subcontractor. Casework and millwork are typically provided by the same subcontractor, but this single subcontractor will include staining of the casework, but not the millwork. This may seem odd, but it's a standard practice, and let me explain why. Millwork is cut to fit and assembled on site. The millwork finish needs to be applied on site after it's in place. On the other hand, because casework is fully assembled in the shop, we can also finish it in the shop. Casework is not cut to fit on site, nor will it have any exposed nail holes. So finishing it in the shop is the most efficient course. Shop finishing is always the responsibility of the respective subcontractor for the item being finished. Field finishing is typically by the painting subcontractor. Painted wood or hollow metal doors are prime painted in the factory, but finish painted on site by the painting subcontractor. Similarly, Painted millwork will be prime painted in the shop by the millwork subcontractor, but finish painted on site by the painting subcontractor. Wood flooring might have a factory finish or a field finish. Factory finishes are the most common, and that will be provided by the wood flooring subcontractor. However, a field applied finish to a wood floor will be the responsibility of the painting subcontractor. Notably, when a wood floor is to be field finished, you may only find this requirement in the wood flooring specification, which the painting bidders are unlikely to read. Be sure to verify whether a wood floor is factory or field finished and clarify that in your bid instructions. Next we'll discuss the sequence for painting the walls. This may sound like a no-brainer, but it actually requires quite a bit of coordination with the other trades, and this sequencing affects both the quality control effort and efficiency of the project. Once the taping work is complete, the painter will prime paint the walls. 
and note that it's a standard practice to use a sandable primer. The reason for using a sandable primer is described in step two. The monolithic color of the prime paint helps identify imperfections. After the walls have been primed, the tapers will come back to touch up the wall surfaces, and naturally once the tapers have touched up their work, the painter will come back to touch up the primer. So this is why we use a sandable primer, because the tapers will be using sandpaper on those walls when they touch up their work. If we didn't use a sandable primer, touching up the taping work would make a mess of the walls. Next. The painter will apply the first finished coat of paint before any wall mounted items are installed. This allows us to paint behind the casework and behind the various flanges of other wall mounted items so we get a nice clean transition and that we don't have any slight lines of bare gypsum board between the painted wall and a wall mounted item. Next, the casework, fire extinguisher cabinets, corner guards, and other wall mounted items are installed. The items being installed now are the fixed items that are actually bolted to the wall. Easily movable items, such as marker boards, tack boards, pictures, and things of that nature, will not be installed until after the painting work is complete. And finally, the painter will apply the second finished coat of paint, which is commonly the last coat of paint. Now, there are exceptions and variations, but walls throughout the industry usually receive one prime coat and two finished coats of paint. And for this final coat, the painter will of course need to tape off all the wall mounted items that have already been installed. The reason we apply the second finished coat of paint after all wall mounted items have been installed is because the walls generally receive some scratches and dings throughout the last course of the finishes of a project and we want to make sure that the project receives a good, clean, final coat of paint shortly before we turn it over to the owner. Before we finish our discussion on the painting trade, I'd like to go through a few odds and ends associated with their scope of work. Caulking the joints between the hollow metal frames and gypsum board wall surfaces will actually be completed by the painting subcontractor. Now where the hollow metal frame is tight to the gypsum board, we don't need to caulk it. It's when the gap gets to be about an eighth of an inch or so that we need to caulk it. Now this is just a construction tolerance. There's really no fault involved with these gaps. And even though the amount of this caulking work is actually a variable at bid time, Painting bidders are still willing to provide this work within their lump sum bids. This is really unique because the two parties responsible for these gaps are the framing and door subcontractors, but it's the painting subcontractor who actually caulks them. The last painter I discussed this with said that they plan for generally about half of the joints to be caulked and are okay with absorbing the risk in their bid for there being more or less caulking. The painter needs to prime paint behind wall coverings. Now at first glance, this might sound unnecessary, but let me explain the reason. If we don't prime the walls, the wall covering adhesive will seep into the paper layer of the gypsum board. Later in the project, when they go to remove the wall covering to paint the wall or put up a different color wall covering, they're going to rip the gypsum board apart and end up having to resheet the entire surface. By priming the wall, the prime paint acts as a sealer to prevent the adhesive from seeping into the gypsum board paper. So later in the life of the building, when the owner goes to remove the wallpaper to replace it or to paint the wall, they won't ruin the wall in the process. Painting subcontractors commonly have indirect work and work resulting from the construction operations to include in their bids. This might include painting pedestrian barricades, and it always includes touch-up painting. This type of work is necessary as part of the construction operation and naturally costs money, but it will not be indicated in the bid documents provided by the design team. So this direction needs to be provided by the general contractor in their bid instructions. Next we'll discuss the safety, sequencing, and scope issues associated with a comparatively straightforward acoustical ceiling scope of work. Dropping ceiling wires through the metal decking prior to placing the concrete is the most economical route for the acoustical ceiling sub, and unless instructed otherwise, this is how they'll plan to install the wires. The problem is that this grid of dangling pointed wires presents a safety hazard throughout the course of construction. Furthermore, when these wires are in place before the MEP work begins, we also have a problem with the MEP subcontractors having to cut the wires out of the way of duct work and pipe runs. Even though the MEP subs will cut the wires, they won't replace the wires or pay for the replacement because the wires are actually in their way and they have no choice. 
And because replacing those wires wasn't included in the acoustical ceiling subcontractor's base bid, the acoustical ceiling subcontractor will submit a change order request to replace them. This is a very common fight on projects. Drilling or shooting these ceiling wires into the bottom of concrete deck immediately prior to the grid installation is generally considered to be the safest route. However, it's also a more expensive route. Delaying this installation will keep them out of the way of the other trades, such as the MEP subcontractors. I do have an exception to this one. I need to note that there are some jurisdictions that require dropping the wires through the deck. Dropping the wires through the deck is generally considered to be a stronger installation, so there are some jurisdictions, such as the California Department of State Architect, that do require the wires to be dropped through the decks. So, before addressing this in your bid instructions, be sure to verify all of your project-specific codes. Ceiling wires cannot be more than 4 feet on center in each direction. Therefore, wide ducts, fan coils, and other large items above the ceiling that are wider than 4 feet will need to be bridged under. This bridging should be the acoustical ceiling subcontractor's responsibility. Now, it might sound simplest to tie the ceiling wires off to the duct supports, fan coil supports, or other items above the ceiling, but the fact is that that is not considered to be a good construction practice. Acoustical ceiling subs often exclude this bridging, expecting the framing subcontractor to provide it for them. However, framing bidders will never include this bridging unless, for some reason, they are specifically directed to. The acoustical ceiling subcontractors are capable of providing this bridging, and they should be specifically required to provide it via the bid instructions. It is most efficient for the acoustical ceiling subcontractor to provide support wires for lights and diffusers that are located in the ceiling grid. This is a seismic issue. In seismically sensitive locales, such as California, each item set in a ceiling grid needs to be independently supported separately from the grid itself. Now, of course, many of you around the world are watching this video from non-seismically sensitive areas, and that's fine. You actually don't need to worry too much about this item until you move, of course. Items mounted in the acoustical ceiling grid typically just need to be clipped to the grid itself, and that's fine. But in seismically sensitive areas like California, we need to suspend each item independently. And the cheapest way of doing this is with wires. We typically use the same type of wire that we use to suspend the acoustical ceiling grid. Acoustical ceiling bidders, mechanical bidders, electrical bidders, and all other bidders commonly exclude provision of these wires. Although mechanical and electrical subcontractors will assume responsibility for actually tying the wires off to their items above the ceiling. It's most cost efficient for the acoustical ceiling subcontractor to just install additional wires through the course of their work. But they won't provide these additional wires unless specifically directed to in the bid instructions. The MEP subs, particularly the mechanical subcontractor, will remove a great deal of acoustical ceiling tiles throughout the course of their commissioning and balancing work. Be sure the MEP subcontractors are also held responsible for replacing the ceiling tiles. This can be a real hassle. At the end of a good sized project, it can be a full time job chasing those MEP guys around and replacing ceiling tiles behind them. MEP subcontractors typically exclude replacing ceiling tiles for a few reasons. One reason is simply because they're not the acoustical ceiling subcontractor. Another reason is because those tiles often chip during removal and replacement, and the MEP subs just don't want the responsibility of having to go get new tiles. And lastly, it's because those tiles are often very hard to pop into place and get to lay flat in a ceiling grid. It can be a real hassle, and, quite frankly, the MEP subcontractors just want to exclude that hassle from their work. If this is not addressed in the bid instructions, the acoustical ceiling and MEP subcontractors will all exclude replacing ceiling tiles, which will turn this into a change order issue and a likely hit to the general contractor's contingency. And also keep in mind that those ceiling tiles will chip when you're trying to replace them, so be sure replacing the chip tiles is also covered. Although we want the MEP subs to replace their own ceiling tiles, it's best to have the acoustical ceiling subcontractor go ahead and include a few extra boxes of ceiling tiles for use by the MEP subs when the tiles chip, because they will chip, and in all fairness, that is really just a natural part of the construction process. Next, we'll move into the most technical of all trades the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire sprinkler scopes of work. Well, let's start this discussion at the bottom of the building. 
with the subdrainage system. The plumbing subcontractor will complete all subdrainage work below and immediately adjacent to the building. Subdrains are typically about a 4 inch perforated pipe in the middle of about a 12 inch by 12 inch bed of drain rock. That bed of drain rock is surrounded by filter fabric to keep the soil out. These drains help prevent groundwater from standing against the building or collecting beneath it, which benefits the waterproofing system. Subdrains are outside the building envelope, but remember, the plumbing has all work below the building and within 5 feet of the building, so subdrains below and surrounding a building are not by the site utility subcontractor, as is sometimes mistaken. For this example, let's discuss a subdrain at the base of a shored wall. This provides for a good example because it's probably the most difficult place to construct a subdrain. The first scope issue we commonly encounter with this work is who will be responsible for removal and replacement of the lagging boards at the bottom of the excavation. Those bottom boards need to be removed and replaced in order to get the subdrains in. Plumbers usually exclude this expecting the shoring subcontractor to do it, and likewise shoring subcontractors always exclude it. It's most appropriate for the plumber to do this themselves. We want to avoid a coordination hassle with having to involve another trade with this relatively simple activity. Unless this is addressed in the bid instructions, the plumbing subcontractor will not include it. Hand digging behind the shoring for the subdrains is very labor intensive and tedious, and it is also commonly excluded by the plumbing bidders. Nevertheless, the plumbing subcontractor should be responsible for the complete subdrain system, which includes this hand digging. Another common exclusion from the plumbing subcontractor is collecting the spoils, hoisting it out of the excavation, off-hauling, and disposal. By the time this subdrain work is completed, the excavation subcontractor will have been long gone from the project site, so we can't have the excavation sub haul it out with the rest of their work. Plumbing subcontractors do not like dealing with these spoils, so they commonly exclude it. Off-hauling of spoils is expensive as it is, and even more so when the spoils reside at the bottom of an excavation. These spoils need to be collected from all across the excavation, hoisted out with a crane, and then trucked off the site. The cost of the crane and the labor hours associated with hoisting all these spoils out of the excavation is a particularly high cost. With the subdrain system, the plumbing subcontractor will naturally include the drain rock and filter fabric around the perforated pipe. However, they commonly exclude backfill and compaction around the subdrain system. The soil needs to be backfilled, properly compacted, and the lagging boards replaced before the plumbing subcontractor walks away. Unless specifically directed and monitored on site, the plumbing subcontractor might just toss some loose soils behind the lagging boards, replace the lagging boards, and be done with it. But this is not sufficient. Uncompacted soils can be very detrimental to the waterproofing membrane, particularly if you're using a bentonite membrane, because those membranes require compression. If we have loose soil behind a bentonite membrane, the bentonite membrane will be likely to fail. And that failure, which will result in a leak and flooding of the basement, can naturally be extremely expensive. Next, let's look at a fire sprinkler example. Now, I'm not sure why this is, but the fire sprinkler trade is commonly referred to as an MEP trade, even though they're not represented in the initials MEP, Mechanical Electrical Plumbing. I'm not exactly sure why we don't call them the MEPF trades. Well, with that logic aside, the fire sprinkler subcontractor is commonly considered one of the MEP trades. Let's talk about fire pumps. The fire sprinkler subcontractor will furnish and install the fire pump, but there are some ancillary items they'll need coordinated with the other trades. The contract drawings may only show a fire pump room and call for a fire pump, but defer the design of the fire pump to the fire sprinkler subcontractor. And that's okay. The fire sprinkler subcontractor can size the fire pump and include it as part of their design build responsibilities. However, there are some things that they will not include. So let's go through a few examples of some potential scope busts associated with the fire pump. These systems can be quite complex, but for the purpose of this course, we're going to stick to the basics with these examples. Power to the fire pump and control panel will be provided by the electrical subcontractor. Sometimes the control panel is integral to the pump, and when it is, you may only need one point of connection for power. But when the control panel is auxiliary to the pump, typically wall-mounted, it will usually require a separate power connection. 
Low voltage conduit and wire will also be provided by the electrical subcontractor. This is due to union jurisdictions. A concrete equipment pad for the pump will be provided by the formwork, rebar, and place and finish subcontractors. This needs to be addressed in the bid instructions for the concrete trades because when the fire pump is designed build, this concrete pad may not be shown on the drawings. Let's go through just a couple more fire sprinkler examples. Fire extinguishers and cabinets are provided by a miscellaneous specialty subcontractor, not by the fire sprinkler subcontractor. Fire hose cabinets are actually provided by the fire sprinkler subcontractor. These two building appendages are quite similar, but they're actually provided by different subcontractors. This is because the fire hose cabinets are actually connected to the sprinkler piping and installed during the rough-in phase. Fire extinguisher cabinets, on the other hand, are just simple wall-mounted items that can be applied towards the end of a project. The fire sprinkler subcontractor will not provide water curtain baffles. These baffles are usually low-hanging glass or plexiglass, as you see in this photo, and they're used in locations where a fire-rated wall is required by code, but the architect would prefer not to put a wall there. Open staircases and lobby areas are very common applications for these baffles. How these work is the fire sprinkler head will shoot water against the baffle and then the water will shed down thus creating a wall of water. This wall of water creates the code required separation. Sprinkler subcontractors don't do glass work and glass subcontractors routinely exclude these baffles. It's most appropriate for the glass subcontractor to include these but because most glass subcontractors want absolutely nothing to do with the liability of fire protection, it commonly requires a little bit of arm twisting to get these covered. Next we'll move to the mechanical scope. This is the MEP sub that I'd like to spend the most time talking about because coordination between the mechanical work and work of other trades can be quite complex. Unlike other trades, the mechanical subcontractor frequently employs their own lower tier electrical subcontractor to provide their low voltage controls work. This is a common approach on larger commercial projects when there's a great deal of low voltage work associated with the mechanical systems. This can include all conduit and wire for elaborate building management systems, low voltage circuits for variable air volume boxes and fire smoke dampers, and all conduit and wire for carbon monoxide monitoring systems that are routinely installed in parking garages. When it comes to condensate, we always want primary and secondary containment. So for instance, when fan coils do not have integral secondary drain pans, we'll need to specially fabricate a pan. This should be provided by the mechanical subcontractor, although the flashing sub is another viable option. Mechanical subcontractors commonly exclude these pans, and so do flashing subcontractors. The important thing is to be sure that they're covered, but not double covered. Regardless of who provides the drain pan itself, the condensate drain piping will be provided by the plumbing subcontractor. This delegation of work is naturally because piping falls under the plumbing subcontractor's union jurisdiction. Next, let's talk about generators. The electrical subcontractor will provide the generator. Although the generator's muffler comes with the generator, it's shipped loose separate from the generator. Due to union jurisdictions, the mechanical subcontractor will actually install the muffler. Mechanical subcontractors will not include this in their bids unless they're specifically directed to in the bid instructions. This is primarily because the generator may only be referred to in the electrical documents, which the mechanical bidders won't review prior to bidding. However, the mechanical subcontractor will both furnish and install the exhaust stack beyond the muffler. Exhaust stacks may not be necessary for exterior generators, but they will be necessary for interior mounted generators. Only the muffler will be shipped with the generator. The exhaust stack beyond the muffler will not. Not only will the materials for the exhaust stack be furnished by the mechanical subcontractor, but that exhaust stack will also be shown on the mechanical drawings. I point this out for clarity, because although the muffler is a common scope bust, the exhaust stack itself is not. Waterproofing penetrations should always have a single source of responsibility. In this example, the mechanical subcontractor should be fully responsible for sealing a duct penetration through the roofing membrane. These vertical duct penetrations can be very awkward, problematic, and frequent sources of leaks. This penetration could involve the mechanical subcontractor who provides the duct, 
the flashing subcontractor to provide the flashing from the duct over the roof curb, and even the caulking subcontractor to seal all these pieces together. In the event of a leak, all three of these subcontractors would get a call, and all three of them would point the finger at the other guy and say, I'm sure it's not my responsibility. The mechanical subcontractor is fully capable of providing the duct, flashing, and sealants, and they should be held fully responsible for sealing from their duct to the roof curb. Duct-mounted smoke detectors, which are commonly found adjacent to fire smoke dampers, require multiple subcontractors. These duct-mounted smoke detectors are rarely a change order issue. Nevertheless, because there are so many subcontractors involved with these items, I'd like to run through the responsibilities rather quickly for the purpose of familiarizing the younger audience with this scope of work. Okay, let's run through these. The duct detector will be furnished by the fire alarm subcontractor. The mechanical subcontractor will install the duct detector and interconnect it to the fire smoke damper. The mechanical subcontractor will provide an access door in the side of the duct for both construction purposes and for maintenance purposes through the life of the building. The electrical subcontractor will run conduit to the duct detector. The fire alarm subcontractor will furnish, pull, and terminate the control wiring between the fire alarm panel and the duct detector. Commissioning of the duct detector and associated fire smoke damper is a joint effort of the fire alarm and mechanical subcontractors. Variable frequency drives also require a joint effort. VFDs are what makes equipment run at variable speeds, such as air handler units or exhaust fans. Sometimes the VFDs are integral to the equipment, but quite often they're separate. So let's discuss the scope scenario for VFDs that are not integral to equipment. The VFD will be furnished by the mechanical subcontractor. Mounting of the VFD should be the responsibility of the mechanical subcontractor. When there isn't a wall adjacent to the equipment, say within five or six feet, and there often isn't, the VFDs will require mounting racks. And these racks are usually constructed out of unistrut or pipe. The mechanical subcontractor should also include these racks. Mounting of the VFDs and the respective racks are common exclusions by both mechanical and electrical subcontractors and often paid for out of the general contractor's contingency. Be sure to address these racks and the mounting of the VFDs in your bid instructions. The electrical subcontractor will provide power to the VFD. This will be shown in the electrical drawings and is not a potential scope bust. The electrical subcontractor also needs to provide the circuit between the VFD and the equipment. This circuit is a common scope bust. This is what's termed medium voltage power, typically either 220 or 480, not low voltage, so it needs to be done by the electrician. Unless otherwise instructed, electrical bidders will make the assumption that VFDs are factory mounted to the equipment. And in that case, the circuit between the VFD and the equipment is done at the factory before the equipment is shipped to the site. So it's this second circuit that's a common scope bust. And finally, the mechanical subcontractor will commission the VFD along with its respective equipment. The mechanical subcontractor will provide the building management system, including all of the conduit and wire for the control circuits. The majority of what a building management system monitors is mechanical work. This is why the mechanical subcontractor is responsible for it. But mechanical components are not the only thing that building management systems monitor. The mechanical subcontractor will often need to pick up points from other trades. So let me give you a few examples of this. A temperature sensor in the domestic water system is furnished and installed by the plumbing subcontractor. This sensor will have what's called dry contacts for the mechanical subcontractor to tie it into the building management system. Provision of that monitoring circuit, as well as tying it in and commissioning it with the building management system, will be by the mechanical subcontractor. The generator controls will be completed by the electrical subcontractor. However, the generator run status, fuel level, engine temperature, and other traits are commonly monitored by the building management system. The generator control panel will have dry contacts for the mechanical subcontractor to tie their monitoring circuit into. The elevators may also be monitored by the building management system. This circuit will transmit information such as which floor an elevator is on, and a trouble indicator if the elevator is having problems. Let's now move to the electrical scope of work while continuing this topic on low voltage. 
Most low-voltage circuits are provided by the electrical subcontractor for the multitude of subcontractors requiring them. Scope gaps are very common for low-voltage work, primarily because control circuits are such eclectic elements of work that aren't commonly found on the drawings. There are four basic elements of work for a control circuit. Conduit, pulling the wire, terminating the wire on each end, and commissioning. Due to union jurisdictions, the electrical sub will provide the conduit, pull the wire, and terminate the wire, while the commissioning is completed by the respective item's subcontractor. But of course there are exceptions to this general rule of thumb. For instance, flat screen TVs commonly have special wiring harnesses that are furnished by the AV sub. Teledata, security, AV, fire alarm, and similar low-voltage specialty subcontractors traditionally pull their own wire. And although the electrical subcontractor will need to provide conduit for the elevator recall switch, the elevator subcontractor will provide their own cabling. Note that the mechanical subcontractor does not always complete their own low-voltage controls work, especially for smaller projects, or a project that does not have a building management system, there won't be very many control circuits associated with mechanical work. In these cases, the mechanical bidders are likely to exclude control circuits with the expectation of relying on the electrical subcontractor for that work. Some examples of control circuits that the electrical subcontractor will be responsible for include items such as coiling doors, dock levelers, roller shades, sump pumps, fire pumps, accordion walls, projection screens, and irrigation rain sensors. As you can see, this is a very diverse and eclectic list of items. Before we end this course, let's discuss a few eclectic scope of work issues that are related to the electrical trade. Electrical subcontractors don't just provide conduit, they provide all raceways for wiring, which includes cable trays and wire molds. Plywood backboards in electrical and teledata rooms may only be shown on the electrical or teledata drawings, but neither the electrical or low voltage subcontractors will provide them. These backboards will need to be provided by either the general contractor themselves or the framing subcontractor. This is a very common scope bust when these backboards are not shown on the architectural drawings. Interestingly, light pole footings for site lighting that are constructed per the light pole manufacturer's standard detail are actually constructed by the electrical subcontractor, not the site concrete sub. Now this is only true when the light pole footings are per the manufacturer's standard detail, which they usually are. But in cases where we have poles that are mounted on top of an architectural element, such as a seat wall, that seat wall is of course constructed by the site concrete subcontractor. Well, that wraps up this third and final part of the three-part series. I hope you've enjoyed this series and have attained some good knowledge that will benefit you through the course of your career. I wish you all the best of luck.